So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and uh, joining me here today. So um, thank you, Dr. Melinda, for the kind introduction. I am honoured to, to have this platform to share with you some things about nutrition, some useful tips and case scenarios of the patients that I've seen during my time as an oncology dietitian. So without further ado, let's start the journey. So a lot of my patients actually share with me that this is the first page that they go to for nutrition advice. Okay, they're not sure what to eat and they just want to make sure that everything is done correctly now, right? However, it is really important to know that currently there's no evidence uh, for any long-term special diet, specifically for myeloma patients, okay, that might differ from the general population. So what can we do then? So today my talk will hopefully answer most of your questions, okay? Uh, knowing the importance of good nutrition, management, uh, man management of your symptoms, side effects, of your treatment and food anxiety, uh, addressing some of your dietary myths that you might have questions about, what exactly can you eat during and after your treatment. So um, to really uh, dig down to how important nutrition is, we need to know how um, often it happens to our patients. The prevalence of malnutrition in cancer patients is up to 70%. Okay, and of these, 90% of those with advanced disease uh, actually suffer from malnutrition. And one in five uh, of cancer patients actually succumb to uh, uh, malnutrition instead of cancer itself. So how will good nutrition help you? It helps you maintain body weight. Uh, provides energy to complete basic tasks, boosts your immune system, prevent uh, any treatment delays, reduce toxicity to chemotherapy, and reduce hospital admissions, improve quality of life and survival rate, and reduce your risk of cancer recurrence. So, uh, I have two patients that are very different, okay, they have very different nutrition journey. Imagine how they look like as I present their cases. So I have Mr. A and Mr. B. Mr. A said, I can only eat three spoons of rice every meal and I can only drink two cups of water. And Mr. B said, I can actually finish a plate of stir-fried chicken and rice from the Zizha stall and drink two liters of water a day. So Mr. B actually started with 68 kilos and lost six kilos uh, from the start, uh, even before starting his treatment, and lost another 10 kilos to 52 kilos during the whole journey of uh, completing his chemotherapy. So he said I became too weak for the treatment and my doctor said that I probably need a tube feeding to optimize my nutrition. And Mr. B similarly started with 68 kilos. Okay. After the diagnosis, he lost about 3 kilos in 2 months. After seeing the dietitian, he managed to maintain his weight and complete his treatment smoothly. So this is how Mr. A looks like. He's malnourished and Mr. B well-nourished. And this is how they look like um, probably a few weeks into the treatment. Okay, one on the bed, multiple uh, admissions, and the other one can be discharged soon after. So one of the biggest barriers I have uh, to keeping my patient eating well is uh, the anxiety around food. So they will usually come in with lots of questions to begin with. Okay, so it's my job to actually make sure that all their questions are answered before we can dig down to what exactly should they do. So because of a lot of fear around food, um, a lot of um, important food groups are actually excluded and uh, the enjoyment around food actually start to reduce. So some of my patients would say, oh, my children don't allow me to eat. Uh, what I like, always less oil, less salt, steam everything, how to eat. 
my sister said to avoid sugar because sugar makes cancer cells grow faster. And I found a video on YouTube saying that cancer patients should avoid seafood, chicken, meat, dairy products. So is it true? So all these things actually can increase weight loss, fatigue and weakness, risk of malnutrition and a lot of avoidable confusion and stress, low mood as well, and reduce your tolerance to treatment and quality of life. So if there's any caregiver in the audience, I would really want to take this opportunity to show you how uh, I appreciate your, your help in terms of giving comfort to your loved ones during this tough, long journey. Um, I think the best way to actually give support is to provide good nutrition. And sometimes it can be quite confusing to know what to look out for in Google, who are the people who are writing that information, if they have any um, even... Uh, like if they even study nutrition from a credible source, okay? So try to reach out to your healthcare professionals uh, if you need any help. So some of the common dietary myths that I have, I won't be able to go through every single one uh, today, but these are the common ones around sugar, red meat, some growth hormones in chicken, juicing, alkaline water, and so on. There are just so many. So today I'll be addressing um, two, two of these. Okay, so the most common one would be sugar feeds cancer cells. So how many of you actually believe in this? Oh, I'm quite happy that some of them are shaking, shaking your head. Huh? Okay, so actually just to clarify things, uh, what are the scientific background behind it? So all, all cells in the body actually require glucose, which is sugar, for our body you know, to function. Okay, this includes your healthy cells, not to forget. So if the body actually lacks glucose from carbohydrates or sh your refined sugars, our protein and fat stores will be compromised. So they will be used as energy for you to function. And that can actually lead to rapid weight loss, and over time, this can happen. So actually, the only group of uh, people who need to avoid refined sugars would be those with diabetes. Okay, so the myth number two, alkaline diet or water. So some people might find that, uh, oh, okay, uh, I heard that cancer cells actually thrive in acidic environments. So I believe that changing my diet to a more alkaline environment can actually help to stop the cancer cell from growing. It may seem quite logical, right? So this idea actually came about um, in 2002 by this guy called Robert Young, Robert O. Young, who promoted the theory of alkaline diet or alkaline water to treat diseases or prevent diseases such as cancer. So let's dig down to the credentials, okay? So this Mr. Robert actually is a naturopath practitioner. He is not a medical doctor, he, and he did not graduate from university. But a lot of people actually believe in them. And some of my patients as well, they will buy alkaline water, liters and liters of them during their transplant, okay? so. Of course, after we look into the credentials, do you want to still believe him? So the second thing would, we would want to look for uh, is also the studies behind uh, this, this statement. So try to critically analyze the studies. Of course, I don't, um, I, I don't think that everyone would be equipped with the knowledge to actually critically uh, look into the studies, but you can actually reach out to your healthcare professionals for help. So uh, these studies uh, on this topic actually were done in, the, in a lab dish, like you can see from the, the, the pink color Petri dish. Yeah? So they actually cannot represent how complex our cancer cells um, or our tumors function in our body. So the takeaway from this slide is actually to know that the human body naturally does an excellent job at keeping our body at a tight pH of 7.3 to 7.4, and it can be life-threatening anything above or below this. Okay, so there's no amount of water, alkaline water or food that can actually change your blood pH. 
And just for your information, on the pH meter uh, on my right, uh, you can have a look at the tap water is actually pH 7, and alkaline water is usually 8 to 9.9. .9. So some of the alkaline water that we can see in the local supermarket would be these 12 bottles of uh, 1.5 litre uh, of distilled water actually cost $5.90. Uh, $5 but alkaline water, the same amount, actually cost $32.40. So is it really worth the money? And that's another example of a 2 litre alkaline water. So what is most important is to stay hydrated during your treatment, okay? Not so much on uh, alkaline water or not. Okay, so um, after recognizing that, uh, remember that the only possible way to keep your cancer controlled is the cancer treatment recommended by your doctor. So there's no single food that can cure or protect you against cancer. So it is extremely important to eat well, to stay fit for your treatment. So now after we recognize all that, you know, clarifying all your questions, we can now focus on what exactly should we do. So we should manage uh, your symptoms well, okay? If let's say you have nausea and vomiting, mouth ulcer, any diarrhea, constipation, any pain, do feel free to inform your doctors. Actually, it's really important to inform your doctors so that they can give you medications to help you manage them better. Then we can start eating well after. Any loss of appetite and taste change, uh, doctors usually will help. Uh, we, we are lucky to have a really supportive group of doctors who would refer you to a dietitian for further discussion on how to help you with this. Okay, so now the second part would be asking yourself, what should I be eating then? So, because the portion size of food usually with loss of appetite is actually smaller than your usual portion, so it is really important to maximize your calorie and maximize your protein. And one of the things that I usually tell my patient is to eat according to time, not hunger. Okay, just look at the clock so that you can have an indication of what time is the eating time. No matter how uh, demotivated you may be, it, no matter how much you feel like it's a chore, so number two is to remove unnecessary food restrictions. I think I've talked more than enough about that uh, just now. So in terms of protein, uh, what is really important is that, uh, like what previously uh, some of the doctors have covered, that we actually have a higher risk of bone pain and um, restrictions in your movement. So that can actually promote uh, muscle wasting. So what is important is to increase your protein intake in your diet to hopefully slow down the process of muscle wasting. Okay, so some of the good sources here that we have are like maybe well-cooked beef, chicken, pork, some seafood. Um, usually if you're on transplant, I would encourage you to avoid crabs or uh, like clams because they are harder to uh, clean due to hygiene reasons, yeah. Uh, fish. And if you're vegetarian, you can try eggs, cheese, tofu, beans and lentils, and soy milk. And if you're losing weight, uh, there needs to be extra effort to make sure that you can try to stabilize your weight as much as we can. So try to fortify your snacks and meals with healthier fats and sugar. For example, the first example I have here is to add some olive oil or sesame oil in your porridge or in your soup in any of your food, and you can add a slab of maybe butter or margarine onto your maybe steamed item, some steamed corn or steamed sweet potatoes. Okay, you can see how much calorie that adds on already. And uh, you can add a, a slice or two of cheese on your naan, on your bread, so that can actually add on small but steady amount of calorie for you. Okay, so swap any plain water for calorie-containing drinks. So like maybe fresh milk, soy milk, glucolin powder into your water, some cereal drinks and fruit juices. Try higher calorie cooking techniques. So just now I mentioned that a lot of maybe uh, people might want to go for steamed food, uh, boil your food, eat, eating extremely clean. But actually this is not the right time when you're on treatment. You need the calorie right, to maintain your body weight. 
So for example, pan frying is perfectly fine. You can use healthy oil, uh, like canola oil, sunflower oil. You can stir fry your food, definitely. And sometimes actually treat yourself for some deep fried you know, chicken. And start taking some nutritional supplements. A lot of the times, uh, my patients find it quite difficult to maintain their weight with um, food alone. Yeah. So ask your doctor for a referral for a dietitian if you're really not too sure about which one to pick. So there are just too many in the market right now. So uh, a dietitian would be able to best advise you which one would be the best option based on how much you're eating now and what is your target uh, calorie and protein requirements. So should I be taking supplements? This is also a very common question um, uh, from my patients. So there's actually no antioxidant-rich supplements allowed during your treatment, okay? And no supplements can actually fully treat, cure, or prevent your cancer. If there's no proven deficiency, there's actually no benefit for additional supplements, okay? So if, that, if you're concerned about any deficiency, do feel free to speak to your doctor so they can check, check them out for you. And most importantly is get your nutrients from natural foods. So you don't have to worry too much if they clash with your medications. So neutropenic diet. So uh, some of you might heard of this neutropenic diet, a term that is commonly used amongst your healthcare professionals. Okay. So neutropenic diet is actually a diet to reduce your risk of, of infection okay, from the bacteria that might, you might get from food or drinks. Sorry. So to avoid salad, for example, to avoid overnight food or food that has been kept out for more than two hours, okay, avoid expired food, taking fruits that you can only peel off the skin, any packaged food, try to have those individually packed ones, okay, so that once you eat, you just throw them away, try not to keep them. Separate your chopping board and your knives with, um, for the fruits and your raw meat. And if you need to really eat out, try to make sure that you eat out, that, uh, eat out of, the, of the food that is you know, prepared freshly from you. Basically cook on the spot for you instead of those that have been laid out for many hours. So unfortunately, we have to give up on our soft boiled eggs for something like that. Well cooked, okay? And also be really careful about your preparation methods. Try not to soak your meat in uh, the sink for many hours to defrost. Try to defrost in the fridge itself. Because of the temperature change, it can actually promote bacteria growth if you soak it in the sink for many hours. Okay, so now we come to the last part, which is um, after the stem cell transplant, what can we do? So continue to avoid raw food for the six months. The neutropenic diet would have to be continued for three months post-transplant. Okay? Healthy eating, of course, that's what we always want to promote to reduce your risk of cancer recurrence. Try to limit you know, your processed meat, any salt, fat. This is the time when we want to try to eat healthy if your weight can be stable. Okay? Limit any alcohol intake, increase your fiber intake, maintain a healthy body weight and increase physical activity. So you might have heard of this healthy eating quarter quarter half share dance yeah, from the HPB health promotion board. So this is actually to promote healthy eating. Half of your plate should be your fiber, fruits, vegetables. A quarter would be uh, whole grains, your, your brown rice, uh, your high fiber, um, basically carbs. And chicken, fish, your protein would come under the blue section. With a special um, focus on antioxidants because we have to improve, uh, it, it actually has been shown to improve DNA repair and reduce ex anti uh, oxidative stress and inactivate any process of producing cancer cells. So you can see that different colors of fruits and vegetables actually give you different uh, antioxidants, like red will be lycopenes, anthocyanins from your uh, grapes, for example. So how can we forget about hawker food? Right. So these are the ones that we might usually like, but not so good for our health. Yeah, it's okay to, to treat yourself once in a while. 
But what we want to look at is more of the healthier ones if you have to eat them on a daily basis. Okay, so try to go for those that are less oil. Uh, usually they are soupy. Yeah. So I think that comes uh, to the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, I hope that uh, I can address them later. And thank you for your attention.